Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we wanna say thanks for questions coming from our audience of Smith Weekly, including Nick W., Paul M., Todd A., and Linda S. We've got a new guest on the show today. Mr. Ron Hochstein has joined us. Ron is president and CEO of Lundeen Gold, a gold producer focused on its Fruta del Norte mine in southern Ecuador. The company is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol LUG and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol FTMNF. Mr. Hochstein, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks very much for having me. Well, Ron, where are you talking to us from and how is life treating you, sir? Oh, life is treating me pretty well because I'm actually on site here at Fruta del Norte in southeast Ecuador in the rainforest jungle. I love being at site. I was here for six months uh, last year and, and into the early part of this year. It's nice to be back. It's part of just, uh, you know, this new COVID world, you know, management, we can't be traveling back and forth as much as we have. So I've made the decision to be down here and support the team on site here at the mine. Well, Ron, that's great. Good to have you. The temperature and the elevation up there, share that a little bit with the audience. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're, as I say, we're right in the middle of the, the rainforest. So it's pretty, we're, and we're at the equator. So there's not a lot of changes here. We're kind of in the mid 20s during the day, cools down but just to in the eight to nine degrees centigrade in the evenings. Uh, elevation here at the mine site is actually pretty good. We're about 1400 meters above uh, sea level. So not near as high as you see in Quito or other places here in Ecuador. Uh, but the climate's good. The, the main issue we have here, and uh, many of us may know, is uh, because we're in the rainforest, we get about three and a half meters of rainfall a year. And because we're close to the equator, we really don't have a wet and a dry. So we just kind of deal. That's one of the things we deal with here is just the, the rainfall uh, and manage, managing uh, all the aspects around that. Well, Ron, that's great. And being on the equator, I suspect that the sun up and sun down barely changes, if anything at all. It sounds like a pretty unique and, and exotic environment as well. Um, I'd like to have your thoughts on the gold market here, Ron, and where you think we are in this current price cycle, um, assuming if you agree that the bull market got underway in 2016. What are your thoughts? Yeah, the gold market is one of those ones that's, you know, that is more challenging for all of us, you know, the investors, even people that are intimately involved in the production of gold to really look at because there are so many different factors. First of all, yeah, agree that, yeah, this bull market actually started uh, five years ago. And, you know, we saw all time highs of over $2,000 an ounce here just a few months ago, pulled back. But the fundamentals look really good from a number of factors. One is we we had start to see, we've got to remember, 50% of the gold is used in jewelry. And a big chunk of that is China and India. And we've seen China come back, India started to come back, obviously now with the second wave of COVID there, they're pulling back a little, but significant increases in demand there. And then you got the financial side and perception. And what's really gonna drive that is inflation, the US dollar and yields. And all indications are is that, uh, you know, and so we are due for some corrections in those areas, which is all great for gold. Then you throw on the other aspect, which is actually production is actually dropping off in gold. There haven't been a lot of good big discoveries in this industry in, in quite a while. And that forecast, you know, prediction of declining production is going to continue. And that, again, is another great indication uh, for good, strong gold market in the near future. Yeah, I think you hit a lot of them. And I certainly agree with you on the thought process there and what's happening. And, you know, also, I think that there's a big underline that gets, you know, often overlooked, not by yourself or myself, but in the market that the environmental practices, the lead time from a regulatory standpoint, the permitting, 
all of that is getting stretched and stretched and stretched. Either they're not happening, the time from a regulatory standpoint, the lead time is just tremendously longer now. And so I think that also plays a lot into what is starting to happen here. The Fruta del Norte project, an asset that was a counter-cyclical M&A deal with really good timing and really a good price as well, Ron. Talk about the transaction back in 2014 and what attracted the Lundin team to this asset and how did the team reach an agreement with Ken Ross? This asset was originally discovered in 2006 by a company called Aurelian, a Canadian junior, and then Ken Ross acquired it in 2008. And you know, it, today it's still considered what, one of the best uh, gold deposits in the world today in terms of its size. You know, our reserves are over five million ounces, are at a grade of over eight grams per ton. And the discovery hole in this uh, discovery was still one of the best. You know, 200 meters at four grams per ton. The issue was timing with the government, approach, everything. And I think that's what, uh, you know, what makes different, was one of the differentiators for the Lundin group of companies and the Lundin family, who are one of our major shareholders, is that ability to assess country risk, uh, the environment, everything. And Lucas Lundin felt that now was the time was right. You remember Ecuador, when Ken Ross was moving forward, oil prices were really hitting, you know, we were up in the $100 barrel oil. Ecuador is a large oil producer, not large, but they produce about 500,000 barrels a day. They didn't need, you know, something else. And so they kind of became, you know, flavor of the day. With the fall in oil, and now with the country used to having that far large amount of foreign investment, they needed something else. And then they realized the only really thing that they could do is mining. And Ecuador, you look at all the historic mining operations in Chile, Peru, Colombia. Those are some of the biggest deposits in the world today. You know, phenomenal grades, size, everything. Geology doesn't know borders. And the issue is there's just not been a lot of work done in Ecuador, primarily because the Andes is in, in Ecuador is jungle covered and it's more challenging. It doesn't mean that it's not here. So, so much potential. And one thing, other thing that you're listening to may not be aware of, Ecuador is a US dollar economy. It's not that our current, we don't have a currency that's tied to the US dollar. We actually use US dollars here in Ecuador. And so they need that foreign investment. All those factors combined, Lucas Lundin felt now was the time was right to move forward. And yeah, we, we were able to negotiate a, a great deal with Ken Ross. Um, they had spent over 275 million. They purchased a million originally for over a billion. That was a paper deal. Uh, we were able to acquire the deposit for 240 million. And uh, yeah, and if you look at it on a per ounce basis, it's really cheap. Uh, but the timing is right. And we moved right from that acquisition, straight to fees, straight to construction and announced commercial production uh, February of last year. It's a good price uh, across a lot of parameters. The cash flow that the project's starting to throw off here is great. So good on you guys for keeping this going. I think the timing was very good. Pretty much impeccable here as far as your guys' execution on this asset. Um, Keith Barron, him and his team were credited for the Fruta del Norte discovery. Your thoughts on his work in this sector and his work in Ecuador? Keith was part of the team that originally discovered Fruta. And, and you know, one of the things that contributed, and again, thank you very much for your kind words about the, the team and execution here. But one of the things that made it easier for us was with regards to the community work and the social license aspect, which is, as you know, is so important today. The benefit we had is the work that Aurelian did in that front and then Kinross built off of, it gave us a great foundation to move forward. We weren't having to per se dig ourselves out of a hole with regards to how the uh, Fruta del Norte and the, the mining was perceived here with regards to local communities. And in fact, they were welcoming us because they had seen what Aurelian, Keith and his team and Aurelian and Kinross had been able to do in terms of generating jobs, generating local procurement, et cetera. So yeah, Keith and the team started out well. 
you know, and again, their discovery, you gotta remember this thing was totally blind. And so it was, it is an amazing, still an amazing discovery. And what's really exciting is other than Keith and, and Patrick Anderson, two of the leaders in there, we've got that whole exploration team back together again. Steve Leary, Jorge Lema, and a bunch of the Ecuadorian team. And we've started another program just to the south of us here, looking for that next Fruta del Norte. And uh, so we're, yeah, we're really excited about that. Yeah, Ron, that's great. And I want to chat about that here in a moment and about the potential that you guys have just with the existing property and the assets that you do have. But I want to just talk a few more things here before we get directly into the company. Mergers and acquisitions at this point in the market, Ron, um, we're seeing some various transactions out there, more so in the mid-tier area at this moment over the last year, year and a half or so. What is your view on M&A in this sector? And then where do you think Lundin Gold comes into this component going forward now that you guys are well into production cash flow here? M&A in this sector, the, the gold, that's the one other aspect about the production side of things is it is so fragmented. There are so many companies out there producing, you know, producing gold from the small guys up to, you know, the, the very large barrack and Newmont. M&A has to happen. It, it, and it will happen. I think the issue with the gold industry is uh, we just have to, as as company leaders and as responsible, you know, keepers of the shareholder value and everything, we have to do it smart, more smarter than that last run up, uh, last sort of M&A frenzy in the gold space. You know, you're seeing more zero premium type deals, you know, merger of equals, et cetera. That's what we have to be doing. but of any space in the commodity business, gold is probably the most ripe for m and because it is so fragmented. It'll be interesting to see how things go here. And of course, as you guys are building up your war chest, uh, what you guys may do as well. Um, I want to step back for a sec, Ron, because the audience, some of them may not know who you are. I suspect a lot of them do, but can you just you know throw your resume at us for just a moment and give us some of your background? Sure. Yeah, no, I've been involved now with the Lundin family uh, going on 25 years. Uh, makes me feel a bit old, but um, yeah, it's been a great to, part of my career. I actually started with Naranda, uh, no longer around, but was a, one of the can top Canadian mining companies. I'm a metallurgist by background. Started up in, uh, at a copper mine and uh, worked for Naranda for 13 years and moved into consulting and uh, ran several feasibility studies um, and managed feasibility studies, including uh, at the time uh, the project now, Minera Panama, that uh, First Quantum's put into production, Voises Bay uh, were just a couple um, and uh, essentially had two clients, a uh, tech corporation and the Lundin family. So it was, uh, it was kept very busy. And uh, then I, I made the decision. Lucas approached me and said, "How would you like to come work for work for the family versus uh, consulting?" And that's when I made the decision. And I've spent 14 years in the uranium side of the business until this Lucas asked me to take on this opportunity. And um, I've been living in Ecuador. That was one of the things when we did this. We wanted to show we were committed to the country. So I moved to Ecuador in 2015. Yeah, I've been involved with this uh, ever since, and uh, very lucky. I have a great team to support uh, everything we're doing here at London Cold. Yeah, good on you, Ron, for taking the plunge and coming down to Ecuador. And uh, as you probably know over your career, that there's a lot of good places to live. And certainly it's good to see a guy like yourself actually down there at site. We don't see that that often or even living in the country. Uh, so that's a good plus as well. I want to come back to uranium in just a second. And you brought it up, so I'm going to blame you. But the mining business. It often repeats itself with regards to mistakes in the late stages of the cycle. In addition to that, we have a lot of poor actors over in the junior exploration space as well that can catch investors. What are your thoughts on this style as far as the cyclicality goes and what wisdom can you share with regards to how investors should approach this sector? That's a really good point. And it's, it's very unfortunate, uh, you know, it's, you know, I'm very proud to be to sit, tell people I'm in the mining industry and everything, but unfortunately, there are some bad actors. And you know, I think for investors, really, what you have to look at is is the management team, and 
what is that management team, you know, not just what they're currently doing, but what has their past been? Because a leopard just doesn't change his spots. And, you know, the, the history, you know, you have to look at, has this management team been able to bring successful M&A or, or brought projects through successfully in terms of exploration? You know, that's, that's the key. And, you know, we can talk so much about the quality of the projects and everything, you know, but it really comes down to who are the management team, who are the custodians of your dollars as a shareholder? And are they spending it smartly and wisely? And I can't say enough about that, that you have to look at that track record. Absolutely. I contend that management uh, is king out there and that other things are queen and on down the line, if you will. Back to Uranium for just a sec, Ron. You were in the business yeah. for some time in the past. Do you have a view on Uranium today? Yes, you know, I, it, it's still it's part of my makeup. I, you know, I'm still on the board of Denison Mines and I'm very excited about Uranium uh, in terms of, again, I think uh, we, we've come through a bit of a correction. You know, I was there when Fukushima happened and it is going to be as we we're, everything we're doing now, climate change, we talk about it. And what was interesting, I was just looking at a Canadian news website and one of the headlines was about small modular reactors and how important that is going to be for the elimination of greenhouse gas emissions. And people are kind of becoming very much aware of the importance of nuclear energy and the new development technology with small modular reactors. And what that can mean is we really become much more focused on climate change and companies are really looking at how can they move forward. So I'm very excited about uranium. Uranium though is again, investors have to have some patience, but if you've got that patience, you, you definitely, I think will see returns. Absolutely. That patience has paid off well. If you've done the work in the sector, you'll come to the realization that we have an outcome that's very, very positive on the way down the pipeline. Things are shaping up really, really well. Who would have thought, Ron, that you could have taken a small modular reactor out of a nuclear submarine or a battleship and maybe put that into a commercial application, onshore and commercial maritime applications, who would have thought, right, after uh, close to 60 years of operation from a military standpoint? So it's good to see that uh, the light finally turned on. But, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Lundin Gold here. Give us an update on operations and your key objectives to finish out the year. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, again, here I'm here at site, and, you know, we had a really good uh, 2020 was a, a, a real roller coaster year for us. You know, we, achieve commercial production ahead of schedule and we're operating and a month later we had to shut down due to COVID uh, and it wasn't because of COVID here at site it was because of the measures that the country took. Then we started back up in July after implementing protocols and everything and we exceeded guidance for 2020 and for 2021 we're looking at producing between 380 and 420,000 ounces of gold at an all-in sustaining cost of $770 to $830 an ounce. You know, that puts us in the lower quartile of producers, but I think for your listeners, you know, you can just imagine 400,000 ounces and uh, margin today, gold is right around $1,800 so $1,000 an ounce. I think really just your listeners too can do that real quick math that we're gonna have the potential to generate a very significant uh, free cash flow in 2021. And we continue to focus on operational excellence. You know, too many times you get into history, good grades make good miners. We know we know we can continue to keep improving, we bring our costs down, increase our recoveries to produce more gold. We are expanding. We actually have a construction is underway to expand the throughput from 3,500 ton a day to 4,200 ton a day. So those numbers I quoted are getting into that 380 to 420,000 ounces includes us getting up to 4,200 ton a day by the end of the year. And as I say, construction's well underway. And then the other big things for shareholders is our resource expansion and our regional exploration. As we all know, that is what is game changers for companies. And we already have a 14 year mine life but we really believe that we can 
there's a lot more to be found yet underground. So we've got an expansion program that's underway. And we believe that that's going to either increase our mine life or also maybe allow us to increase throughput in a year or two to maintain that level of over 400,000 ounces of gold per year. And then the regional exploration is we're looking for another Fruta del Norte. And we believe we've got the same team that found this one and they really firmly believe they're more out there. This is a 38 square kilometer area that's all 100% owned by Lundin Gold. There's only been 18 drill holes in that whole area outside of Fruta del Norte. That's amazing and that's just so exciting and game changer for our shareholders. Good location, a good setup. I think you guys have set the runway both at the project level and then also at some point, where else are you guys going to look in Ecuador and what the pipeline may reflect as cash flow continues to come in here. But back to the COVID protocols, well done on that because you guys are one of the companies that actually implemented quickly and properly and really hasn't had any issues since those implementations in July. So we've seen people have a lot of challenges. There's even difficulties with some companies today. You guys were able to grab this thing, take care of it, and put it into a really manageable status, Rod. So I, I want to give you guys some credit on that as being one of the first companies out there to actually implement this in the mining sector with good success. The capital structure, Rod, can you just update audience as far as where you guys are today, shares out the current cash level, and then also your status on the debt level? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, we're about just over 230 million shares outstanding uh, right now. And our, we have two major shareholders. Uh, Newcrest Mining owns 32% of those. And the Lundin family owns 27%. Uh, Newcrest was brought in when we were doing the original financing for the project. We looked at strategic versus just financing in the equity markets. We looked at bringing in a strategic investor, uh, which... The whole intent of that was to reduce the, the, you know, the dilution by doing it in one fell swoop versus multiple swoops uh, for our existing shareholders at that time. And then the, the rest of the shareholders are held, uh, shares are held between uh, about 14% retail and then institutional holds the rest. The debt structure right now, we have a gold prepay and a stream, which were part of the very first financing, the 300 million financing we did with Orion and Blackstone. They have subsequently sold that package to Newcrest, so Newcrest owns that as well. I want to express to our listeners that is a little different than uh, for other companies because Ecuador didn't have a lot of history with uh, mining, so we structured that all as debt. So the stream and the gold prepay show up on our balance sheet as debt. And then we also have 350 million of uh, senior debt amongst seven banks, a very conventional debt. Uh, so our debt levels right now, now the issue is, is that gold prepay and that stream are under for accounting rules. We have to adjust those every quarterly based on gold prices. So they can fluctuate quite a bit. Uh, so at times, sometimes, you know, people say, wow, your debt levels look high, but that's the problem. The issue is, is that because we have to account for those when gold prices rise, what we can't account for is how much more value our resources are. Given those higher gold prices, we're going to generate a lot more cash flow, but we can't account for that, obviously. So, you know, debt looks so high, but... We've made all our debt payments to date. We're generating significant cash flow well in excess of our required debt payments. And that's going to be our focus, pay down that debt as fast as we can. You got it. And that was a good clarification to point out. And I was going to ask you about that as well. The focus really is you guys are sitting here at, uh, let's call it 400,000 ounces mid-guidance. Is the really the goal, the first and foremost target, aside from using that cash for exploration expenditures at the project, is the idea to eliminate the debt and then go from there? Absolutely. Yeah, the senior debt, we have the, the, we can do that fairly easily. You know, there's structures, there's cash sweeps, et cetera. So that's where we'll be focused. The gold prepay in the stream, you know, the stream does have two options to buy it out, one in June 2024 and one in 2026. So we'll certainly be looking at those. And the gold prepay, it's really just a, a bet on gold price. Obviously, if it makes sense, we'll do it. Uh, but yeah, the focus is on 
paying down that debt. And then and the board has already talked about this, you know, expiration, obviously capital expenditures here, expansion possibly, but then possibly start looking at return to shareholders if it makes sense. Key people. Maybe there's a few at the company. Uh, I know there's a lot there and they all deserve a lot of credit, but uh, is there a few key people on the management staff and board level that you want to point out, Ron? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Dave DeCare, uh, our VP projects, uh, you know, he was the one that oversaw the construction and got us, you know, uh, unfortunately in this industry to say you were ahead of schedule and under budget is a rarity, unfortunately, in the mining industry. But this team did it, and it's the first mine, Western mine, was built in Ecuador. So I, he did a great job of overshadowing that team. And Dave was also on site. You mentioned our protocols and the great thing. Dave was on site when all that was put together and our startup went so well. And I think the other person I'd like to call out would be Nathan Monash, our VP Sustainability. Again, the first Western mine in Ecuador, you know, we've been able to show that we can do it. And how we've been able to do that is by maintaining our social license. That's part of the culture of the Lundin group of companies, but Nathan has really helped us to show the local communities, the government of Ecuador and shareholders, what responsible mining really means and the opportunities for local communities and local economies, et cetera, through, with responsible mining. So the regional exploration at Fruta del Norte is pretty notable here, Ron, plus the south side of the deposit limits, uh, as far as I can tell, are not completely delineated yet. Talk just about the plans, let's say maybe over the next 18 months. What's the primary targets here that you're looking to go towards in expectation that the mine life can be enhanced and of course the production profile? Uh, this entire package from what I can tell is probably amenable to the existing facilities and that uh, what you guys are going after is within the, the mining footprint, so to speak. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with what you uh, the point you raised about the underground. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. To the south is an area that's currently our inferred resources. And that was drilled from surface, but it was really challenging. So there wasn't a lot of drilling done. We've now drifted off from our underground workings, got drill stations set up. And so we're getting ready to start doing drilling the south. Feel a lot of potential there. and But that's just within the existing sort of resource boundary. There are several holes from surface yet that we believe opportunities even here on this conception to find another Fruit del Norte. Those are ones we'll probably talk about the next 18 months, probably next year, we would look at maybe drilling one or two of those holes. And then the regional. The regional is, you know, there was work done by Keith, if we come back to Keith Barron and his team, there was a lot of work done by Kinross but it was all surface work, all uh, geochem, uh, geological mapping, geophysics, et cetera, but no real drilling. Kinross was all ready to start drilling when they pulled out in, in 2008. And there's an area that we, or sorry, 2012. And we drilled the 18 holes that I mentioned earlier there and a lot of smoke didn't hit the high gold grades, but a lot of smoke there that says we need to keep looking. But over that time, since then, we've developed two new targets, one called Barbasco, one called Puente Princesa, but you're even closer to Fruta del Norte. And I actually hiked into the drill sites uh, not this past weekend, a week ago, and it's looking at core, there's, it's so exciting. Everything we're seeing from this very first hole that we're drilling right now has a lot of similarities to Fruta del Norte. Um, you know, there's a lot more holes in front of us, but the plan would be to, we think with success there that we really would hit that hard with drilling. we got the two targets, Puente Princess and Barbasco. So a lot of potential upside here. And obviously we would hit that pretty hard with, uh, with success. Pipeline in the future, Ron, you know, as cash flows come in here, debt gets paid, et cetera, in the years ahead. Are you guys looking to expand pipeline in Ecuador or will the company look to expand into other jurisdictions in the future? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. I think within Ecuador, we've got such a runway in front of us with that large land package that we have to the south of Fruta del Norte. 
there's so much that can be done there. I talked about two targets. We've already, there were, between Kinross and Aurelian and ourselves, I think there's a total of about 10 to 12 targets there. And we're just talking about two that we've drilled. So we've got a lot of runway there. So for us, and what we think, what we're hearing from our shareholders and that, for us to look at doing something else would be outside of Ecuador because, you know, we do want to look at diversity a little bit in terms of uh, political political risk. We would Our focus would be probably Latin America first because we built up a strong Spanish-speaking team. And then the Americas, I would say, but that would really be our focus. But the key driver is going to be, if we're going to do anything, it's got to be accretive to our shareholders. And that's going to be the challenge. You know, there's, Fruit and Lord is such a great deposit. It's going to be tough for us to do something that uh, will be creative, but there will, there are opportunities out there. And that's the other thing about a lending group company is we can move quickly when opportunities present themselves. Absolutely. It's good to have that type of backing and that type of expertise in all components of mining across the board. Uh, that's excellent. And then, of course, low cost of capital and in most cases, plenty of it most of the time. So looking at Ecuador, and I want to get into the, the jurisdiction a little bit more in a moment and the ESG stuff, but Ron, is there any promising Ecuador peers or development projects that you think have good potential at this point? There's a lot of potential here in Ecuador from a geological standpoint and from a, you know, there's been some historical work done. You know, I think the work that Keith is doing in Orania, you know, obviously he's got the background of, of finding Fruta del Norte. He knows the country. Uh, I think some of the things he's doing, I and B Metals have a project that they're, they've just submitted their environmental permitting recently. Soul Gold, um, you know, a great deposit they have, and they've got a lot of potential uh, exploration upside. The Lumina Group, there's, you know, you could go on and on. Adventus, there's a lot of companies here. All of them have, you know, there's a lot of great projects. You know, I guess that's been our role. That's they keep they look to us, and we've always said no pressure because we've got to make sure that we do it right. So, because we know we're paving the way for many others to follow because we truly believe Ecuador has such huge geological potential. So I think there's going to be, I guess the other, uh, Solaris is another one. I forgot to mention them. They're drilling now too. That's the so exciting thing about this country is the potential geologically and good operators that are here now. It'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, Dan's been doing a nice job over there at Solaris. You guys have set the model for production and uh, construction and a lot of different parameters, social and government relations. You guys have been the model on that front. Be interested to see what Lumina Gold does from here. So yeah, lots of interesting things going. Ron, are you of the opinion that an increasing preference for mining companies to seek more exposure in places like Canada and the United States over what is perceived as more volatile jurisdictions. As from what I can tell, the Lundin Group generally does not have the view of the US and Canada and that it is very comfortable in these other jurisdictions. Have you noticed that on your side as far as you know people coming back to Canada and the US more so? Uh, what's your view on that thought process? You know, I, I think it's so much is dependent upon uh, the management team and the backing of the original management team. You said it yourself that the Lundines have been, always been the ones that haven't been for the faint of heart in terms of, um, you know, Argentina back in Alabrera, you know, going back 30 years ago when no one would touch Argentina. And uh, Alabrera is still probably one of the most successful mines, uh, copper mines that uh, is, is fully operated. Uh, Africa, Tegi um, you know, there's, Lundines have that capability, that gut to say now's the right time to move in. And I can remember when we were with, I was traveling with Lucas to raise the money for the acquisition. And the number of meetings we had that people told us how stupid we were to be even thinking about Ecuador. Um, but again, that's a, that thing. In terms of Canada, the US, I think it, there are still opportunities there, but it's, it is, I think the returns and the geological potential, those two areas have been well explored. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, it is gonna be going out into some areas that haven't seen the work. 
and there will be opportunities. But the key is going to be, and you talked a little bit about it before ESG, is, is also not only having a strong geological and exploration team, but having a good ESG team as well in order to make sure that you can really see that project through. Let's get to the ESG stuff in a moment here, but talk Ecuador in general here for a moment. There has been some hesitation and criticism from some investors. Um, and now it appears that we have a firm path as a consequence of this election. Did you like the outcome? It appeared that uh, the final folks uh, in the election appeared to both be suitable to some degree, but uh, how has your experience been in Ecuador from a government relations standpoint? And do you think they're set on the right path going forward? Yeah, the, the most recent election, I think one of the, the great things was about it was that it was the election happened and you know, we had to go through a second round through both rounds and everything without any incidents, without any violence. It was handled very, very well with the international observers. You know, I think that's the one thing, you know, again, it was uh, a, a, the country showed the democratic process works here in Ecuador. And, uh, you know, that that's the first thing. The, the second is, yeah, the, uh, the group that we have that's been elected, uh, Guillermo Lasso as president of the National Assembly. Yes, we believe we can work. And I'm, I'm actually probably the most excited I've been since I've been here in uh, living in Ecuador with regards to the future for mining. Because, again, it's partly what Mirador, uh, another ch a Chinese operated mine to the north of us, and what we've done. The government is starting to see the benefits of what mining can mean and it's not just revenues to the government to, in terms of nsrs or taxes or anything but also what mining can do in terms of social benefit because mining tends to hire a lot more people than oil and gas so they're seeing what responsible mining can do versus artisanal and small scale they are realizing that so yeah i personally i'm very excited uh, about the opportunities here in Ecuador and with what both parties were saying during the elections and the realization of what mining can mean for the overall improvement in the economy of Ecuador. Yeah, this has got to look good from an economic support standpoint and the local community and just really these projects are of scale that are meaningful that move the needle for these countries without a doubt. You can use Absolutely. a lot of other examples. Yeah. Yeah. I would include, you know, even Nicaragua, for example, even uh, Cobre de Panama, First Quantum. These are needle moving projects and you guys have one of them in Ecuador. So it's an important big deal for both the government, the national standpoint, and then also the local folks as well. That's a big deal. So on the ESG side, Ron, you know, first ESG seems to be more formalized now as compared to prior reiterations like CSR and before that. But the fact is, good, intelligent people in this business have practiced these principles for decades. What do you think of ESG at this point, Ron? It, you know, it's a really interesting point, and I've said this many times before. I've worked for the Lundin family now for over 25 years, and, and Lucas's father, Adolf, was very much involved at that time. Unfortunately, he's passed away. But that was what drove him and his whole family to invest in natural resources, whether it's oil, gas, mining, et cetera, is because he said that's the one way, one of the few industries in the world where you're taking something that's worth zero in the ground, where it's nothing to the government, worth nothing to the people that are there, and truly creating wealth. And you can create wealth for local people, not just the people sitting in the capital cities, but for local people. And he practiced that, and I remember some of the very early projects that that, uh, that I was exposed to, part of the lending group, they were practicing ESG before even those three letters were meant to anything to anybody, CSR, whatever. But that was part of the culture, and it has been part of the culture of the lending group from the very start. ESG today, I think, is 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 good. It's it's putting now, I think, more focus on again on. on on management to ensure that they cover off all those areas. Um, again, I think for your listeners, you have to be careful that you don't have people that are just following the buzzwords and are truly, truly live it. And you can see that as part of their investment, as part of their culture, uh, versus just sort of a, a whitewash of an ESG. But it's what's needed today. It's not just a, um, a fad. It is needed today in order for companies to really build mines and operate mines successfully. 
is a strong social license and it's so important to have that good relationship with local communities to have actually with all levels of government and stress not only just hiring but training you know again you have to have that longer term view in order that uh, you can grow with the local communities well said, Ron. I certainly agree with that view and, and also that uh, even without the acronym that this is going to be practiced in the future and has been in the past and, and is currently, and it's a matter of the right people to carry that out, I think, at the end of the day, which goes back to our broader thesis of management teams um, and how they can make all of these things successful when they put together the right team and the right components to make it happen. Talk about some of the local community initiatives that the company is leading and what was the process of determining what those initiatives would be and also are most important to the community first and of course what the company could support from an economic view given that you guys didn't always have these types of uh, production cash flows at the time you were a developer not long ago really just talk about some of those initiatives how you guys determine which ones to go after and just a few items you'd like to highlight on that that's a really good question. And, you know, I, th I think one of the things that we did early on that helped us to identify what are the important initiatives is we set up a process called these round tables. You know, another term you, see, you hear is participatory dialogue. And we actually did some work with the communities, did a bunch of surveys as to determine what's the key issues, you know, and the ones that you'd expect came up, jobs, procurement, uh, environment. Uh, but there were a few others, uh, you know, infrastructure, just values, agriculture. And so we formed the roundtables around about eight key themes. And then we started having dialogue. These, these roundtables weren't ours. They were the communities. You know, we were just a participant. And through that dialogue, we learned very quickly that jobs was key. But in order to provide jobs, we also needed to raise the level of education. So I think that, that was probably one of our big programs, which is, again, more focused on operations. And we did the very first of its kind in Ecuador, uh, early high school education. There had nothing like that had been done where these programs in Canada, the U.S. are all over the place. But this never been done in this country. So we worked and we had about uh, close to 300 people that had quit school, quit high school, and they wanted to get their high school education. And this required an investment by them, you know, in terms of their time in the evenings or on weekends. We helped with tablets and, and, and some of the teachers. We had over 300 people enrolled. We had 297 graduated with a high school diploma and passed the uh, entrance exam for secondary education that's necessary here in Ecuador. And they range from 18 years old to 70 years old. And, you know, that was the step one. And then from there, we also worked with the Lendine Foundation to develop what's called our PCOM program. And this was about 250 students, kids essentially, that then went through uh, classroom training and then training here at site with mining simulators, process simulators, et cetera. Of those uh, 250, I think 260 people, we have about 85% of them are working for us now as operators and underground, driving truck, driving drills, providing maintenance services, process operators. This group of students who, you know, some of them didn't have a high school education, got into high school education. The others, that, there's quite a few of them had a high school education, but now they're working and last year, we estimated that that group uh, put into the local economy the, about $4 billion in wages that the, they then put into the economy. You can just imagine it would have been nowhere near $4 million if they'd stayed on the farm or something. And I think that's the type of program that shows you got to have that vision. When you came in here as a development company, but what do you need for operations? And there, I could go on and on, but that's probably one of the biggest ones. We've actually won two awards from the UN Global Compact of Canada and the UN Global Compact of Ecuador and Colombia for those programs. And um, it's nice to be recognized by your peers. Uh, but yeah, that's a perfect example of that longer term view and one that had so much impact on the local economy. 
congratulations on the good work. Keep it up. And as you guys continue here with your various projects, as the, the community support and your guys' involvement for you know decades to come, really. So good job on that. And then also my suspicion is too, is, is a lot of these people, I'll bet they were willing to learn. And that is also a big component. I think there's some places on the globe today that uh, you have a labor pool that's not like that. <laughs> and uh, I think that's also a big component of people that are actually have that motivation to go out there, willing to learn, willing to better their lives, get involved in that type of setup. And this is also in a remote area. So it's really a great arrangement that you guys have established there. The company has a market cap and a good structure to support this move. Any plans over the next year or so to list on the NYSE Amex to improve investor access to the company? Um, unfortunately, that's probably not in the cards. Um, it's something the lending group, uh, we've got the one company in a uh, group of companies, Denison, which is listed in the US. Um, we probably will we'll stay on Toronto uh, and, and we feel that we, it gives a lot of investors access to that. But yeah, there's no plans at the current time. Excellent, Ron. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Is Lundin Gold interested in being taken over, or is the goal to grow this company into a senior mid-tier? What's your thoughts there, Ron? That's an easy question to answer. What makes the most sense for our shareholders is going to create the greatest shareholder value. Um, you know, too often management get wed to assets, and but I've always said, uh, many people have heard me say, and when you run a lending group company, you know that the for sale sign is always in the front lawn. It's it's always there. That doesn't mean you don't stop making renovations to your house or maybe buying the lot next door and expanding. You still keep the for sale sign out there because you have to be open. You have to look at what, how can I create shareholder value? And so, and whether that's to sell the company, if it makes sense, then that's what makes sense. But uh, at the same time, you don't sit and wait until the buyer comes along. You keep trying to create that shareholder value and improve the package. Good answer. So Lundin Gold stands at about 2.8 billion Canadian market cap here. For the audience and potential investors in the audience that are listening, why should they get involved as an investor at this point and at current price levels? What would you say to them? I would say to them that this is just the start. This is a, a phenomenal asset. If we cover the points we've gone through, this we, we believe, and I, and you meant this is a great gold market. It's a great time to be in gold. We're going to be generating significant cash flow. We have our four pillars that we're looking at in terms of value creation. Continue to keep pushing operational excellence, expansion, increase our throughput, resource expansion underground. And then the big game changer, regional exploration, all of these things. And then you throw on top of it a rising gold market. And then just that Lundin family focus on shareholder value means it's a great time to get into Lundin gold. It's going to be very exciting, I think, over the next little while. And plus, throw on top of it the changing climate here in Ecuador. We believe that it's a great time. Really excited about it. Good tailwinds. Ron, best way for investors to get in touch with the company? Best way to get in touch with the company is uh, they can view our website at www.lendinggold.com and there's access there to our information line, which puts us directly in touch with our investor relations. And as always, uh, we look forward to receiving any inquiries uh, anyone may have and we'll respond really quickly. But again, www.lendinggold.com. Well, Ron, good chat here. Let's leave it there. Uh, thanks for taking the time to come on and talk about Lundin Gold and your experience in this business. We appreciate it. Well, thanks very much. Really appreciate your time and uh, your listeners uh, as well. Thank you very much.